So if you're an RVer, if you've ever RVed, you don't necessarily need to be right next to where you're trying to go, but you want to be close and close is relative. It might be an hour, it might be 30 minutes, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and so, hey, is there a draw? Is there a reason somebody want to be there? Is it near a major highway? Does it have a water feature? And is it a place that I or my family would, would ever want to visit? Are kind of the basic criteria that we look at. And if I had better criteria, there'd probably be a lot of more people in the space because there'd be a lot more data, but right now there's not. So I'm making my own and we're making it work. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Jeremy Hands is a former Navy helicopter pilot who began investing in multifamily and commercial real estate while on active duty. He skipped residential real estate almost entirely, and recently he has pivoted from multifamily syndications to RV parks, amongst other things. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me. Glad hey, to be man. Here. Pleasure's mine. Three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Sure. So uh, Jeremy Hans uh, started as a middle-class white kid from the uh, suburbs of America, as white bread as they come, right? So uh, I did all the right things, went to school and learned nothing, but you know, just keep taking the next step to get a job, join the Navy, because uh, I thought that was the next step in my life to get, to get me started. That was great. Had a great time, but I realized pretty quick, the harder you work in the Navy, the more work you get and you don't get paid a dollar more. And so uh, started planning my exit uh, pretty early on. Uh, first thing I ever bought was a fourplex in San Diego as a 22-year-old kid, house hacked and bird before those were words. Uh, and then got moved, not by my own choice, to uh, Pensacola, Florida and realized I got to do something else, right? There's no fourplexes to buy here. And so jumped into commercial real estate on a small scale, met a partner trying to buy the same mobile home park. And then together, we kind of get uh, got a bunch of education, started just doing deals, started syndicating on a small scale and slowly kind of grown that to climb capital. So today we're a team of about 10, uh, primarily focused on syndicating RV parks uh, and then doing some private equity stuff on the side as we continue to sell uh, and operate a few of our apartment and mobile home park deals still. Wow, man, that's a lot of moving pieces. Now <laughs> you you are you're still active military. You're a reservist. Where, where what's your status? So I uh, I'm a reservist. So I left active duty in 2017. Uh, did a couple more years on active orders as a reservist, but now I'm just a part time 60 day a year flying helicopter pilot in the Navy Reserves instructing right. down here. Oh man, that's uh, that's really cool. You you have a lot of a lot of things in the air. What's what's something, or a lot of moving pieces? Like balls in the air was a phrase I was looking for. A lot of balls in the air, a lot of moving pieces. How do you organize all of it? Um, you know, I, I think the thing that I tell people all the time, right? I also got four kids, got an airplane, do a lot of stuff at church, right? I keep it busy, right? Uh, you could give me multiple millions of dollars in my bank account tomorrow, I wouldn't change what I'm doing. Right. So I've chosen the lifestyle that I want to live. I want to run a company. I want to be able to do these things. I know that's going to mean a lot of work right now. I'm okay with that. Um, I know that's going to be a lot of long days with little kids. I'm okay with that. Um, and it's just putting kind of, you know, lifestyle priority uh, in check. And maybe that means uh, I don't hang out and watch as much Netflix as I'd like, uh, but I get a lot done. So uh, <laughs> I think that's my answer. And Netflix isn't that much fun anyway. Let's let's all be honest. That's uh, that's what Listen, when you don't watch it for a month or two and you go back, like there's nothing you want to watch. Like it's amazing how, you know, it becomes an addiction that you don't even realize when you stop, you know, doing some of that stuff that Oh, for sure. For sure. And they, and again, you're building the lifestyle that you want and I think a lot of people times people use Netflix as an excuse to get away from the lifestyle they built. So, right. it's uh, right. you know, that's uh that's that's awesome, man. Good for you. Tell me, when did you guys switch from multifamily to now syndicating RV parks? So, we made a pivot uh, really at the end of 2021. Uh, we bought our first RV park beginning of 2020. Kind of on a, weren't even really planning to do it. Just kind of a deal fell in our lap, and then a second one the same. And then we looked up in the middle of 2021 and we said, "Hey, COVID eviction moratoriums were terrible. Um, these deals for Class C multifamily are getting really thin. The people are not getting any better. The locations aren't getting any better. But these RV parks, like they're making a ton of money. The people are all happy to be here. They're growing by leaps and bounds. There's no information. Let's jump and do something a little bit different." So. Uh, we kind of had a hard conversation, a lot of teeth sucking, said, okay, let's do it. So uh, we decided let's sell off everything else and let's put our full focus on this kind of macro trend right now. And uh, we'll ride this until uh, the wave crashes, I guess. <laughs> well, ho hopefully, uh, hopefully the wave doesn't crash, but tell me, tell me what, uh, I guess, what were the things that turned, you know, you the deal fell in your lap, which I think is yeah. a funny part of the story. Like for most of us, we're all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah. And then there it was. And then I just did it. Um, yeah. but it, there had to be enough compelling information that came your way as you guys dissected this first deal that said, man, this is where we need to go long. What right. So, you know, we, we kind of stair-stepped it. Our first deal was an RV park 
in the RV park space wasn't RV park, but it really looked operated more like a, a mobile home park. Right. And so um, we had to learn some of the complexities of the RVs specifically, but the actual model was much more mobile home park esque, which is something we understood and done for years. Um, and in that process, we brought in our own in-house management from day one. And so we had a little bit more flexibility. So then when we bought our second RV park, that was actually a traditional kind of resort style, you know, destination RV park, we kind of already had built half of the team necessary to run that thing. And so what has been hard for a lot of other people to switch to, which is you can't just call up somebody off the internet to go run your RV park. Uh, we had already built basically half the system to be able to do that. And so uh, that second RV park is when we really realized, hey, if we kind of dig into this a little bit deeper, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and so that's when we really started, hey, to expand, you know, basically provide the same CapEx kind of turnaround that we did into a Class C multifamily, similar idea, right, into a hospitality product um, and just kind of watch that continue to succeed. And then macro, I mean, People want to do, you know, live on the road, remote work, uh, ubiquitous internet's everywhere. So people feel like they can do it now. People want to take, you know, mid, midlife retirements, traveling with their kids for a year. I mean, van life, you name it. There's people that want to be on the road. COVID has changed, I think, a lot of people's outlooks uh, on what travel looks like and what they want to be doing. And so uh, I think we're really meeting a demand um, that right now has not really been kind of eaten up by the institutional investors yet. Right. No, it hasn't. Why do you, why do you think that is? It's hard, right? Uh, it's hard because nobody has the management system in place to be able to, in a box to go to go buy an RV park tomorrow, right? They're all different. They're businesses that require a lot more work. Um, totally could be uh, in time as like people kind of build out these systems a little bit better. Uh, but until your hotel type spaces moves into the RV park space, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, to kind of play that Delta uh, really in cap rates, which you can still buy RV parks a lot better than you can buy a mobile home park and make a lot more money. So um, yeah, that's we'll that for a few years. A absolutely, absolutely. What's your long term plan with it? I mean, because these are these are known, like you said, for producing an excellent income stream. Is your idea to hold on to them in perpetuity? You going to package them all up and sell them once the institutions start coming in? What, what's your long term plan? I, I see myself as a deal junkie, right? So at the end of the day, when somebody wants to pay me, what I would assume is too much money for them in the future, uh, we'll likely package them together and try to sell them off to institutional investors. Um, but I think the only place you can the only way you can get to that is when you have years of experience. Uh, with a really solid system and some pretty good product. And so our process right now is to continue over the next two to three years to really try to buy as much as we can, update, systemize, make sure things are running really at the peak efficiency, continue to scale, and then be in a position to kind of see either, hey, we want to hold these long-term and we want to be the guys, or hey, we want to sell these off and go find our next big adventure. But I'm an adventure guy, so I can't claim that in 10 years or 20 years, I'll necessarily be the RV park guy I am today. Right. Understood. Understood. What does a deal look like in the RV resort space right now for you? Um, for us, it's trying to provide an opportunity for us to provide value, right? So we want to create value. Uh, typically, that looks like some kind of expansion, uh, typically some kind of ability to uh, raise rents to a more of a market standard. That market is really fungible. It's hard to kind of tell where it's at, but trying to you know understand where that is and can we push it. Um, providing other ancillary services that can also get paid for, um, and then I think the big one for us is just marketing uh, and putting together business systems and processes. We're buying RV parks from people that don't have online booking, right? We're buying RV parks from guys who you know have got the same lady that's running it for twenty or thirty years, and she's doing a great job for what she knows, but she doesn't know how to use online digital marketing, right? And so they're just leaving money on the table because they're not running like a business. And so if I can run a business where somebody else has had a hobby, uh, I typically can find a way to make some money on that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there um, you know, a geographic focus for you guys? Is there somewhere you say, hey, this is better than that? What What is that? Yeah. So I think that's a funny question. Um, our, our company's name is Climb Capital, right? Which was supposed to be like Climb Out Capital, the idea of like flying, taking off, right? Got it. Um, climb Out also kind of proceeds maybe you're climbing out of like a ditch. And so we just went with climb. Uh, but the reason we we named it that, right, both military aviators, my partner and I that founded it, we wanted to create a business that uh, built a lifestyle that we wanted to have. So one, right, we both like to RV. I, I met my wife actually growing up with my parents, you know, RVing, going on camping trips. Um, but we want to be able to buy an airplane. And so we bought an airplane and we want to be able to have a reason to fly it. So we want to buy stuff in the Southeast. We're based out of Pensacola, Florida. We want to buy stuff far enough away that it convinces our wives that we need to keep this airplane. Um, and so really anything from Texas to the Carolinas um, and uh, any place where I can go get, get a reason to fly away, a place I want to be myself, right? So tired of dealing with classy places, classy people, classy problems. I want to go buy vacation properties and vacation areas and vacation people and enjoy my life while I make a little bit of money. 
So that's an interesting point and maybe a differentiator that you put on there was vacation properties and vacation places that you want a vacation. Is there a difference between um, the RV resorts you were looking at versus maybe something in a flyover state? Uh, yeah, I, there's absolutely opportunities for destination RV parks in flyover states. Um, you know, we're really heavy in places like Alabama. Some people don't think Alabama is like a place that you want to be, but we're doing great there. Um, right. I think it's more of an issue of where does it kind of fit in the local kind of uh, economy in both uh, size, location, uh, and distance to things that people want to be at. So if you're an RVer, if you've ever RVed, you don't necessarily need to be right next to where you're trying to go, but you want to be close and close is relative. It might be an hour, it might be 30 minutes, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and so, Hey, is there a draw? Is there a reason somebody want to be there? Is it near a major highway? Does it have a water feature? And is it a place that I or my family would, would ever want to visit are kind of the basic criteria that we look at. And if I had better criteria, there'd probably be a lot of more people in the space because there'd be a lot more data, but right now there's not. So I'm making my own and we're making it work. That's it. That's it. And I think that's where the opportunity lies. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, that, that a lot of people are, it, it's overlooked because there's just, there is no data. Absolutely. There's, there's, sure. there's not data. There's not good management. There's not, it's a, it's a very fragmented, I think, industry. Absolutely. Um, which, you know, for those who are willing to, um, you know, be, be the, be, be the front runners into it and pioneer the, the professionalization, if that's even a word. Mm-hmm. I just made it up uh, of the space, you know, as you, as you bring more, more, more of a, a, a institutional approach to owning and operating. I mean, this is, yeah, this is to us, this is not an unknown, right? This is the same thing that happened in apartments 10 or 15 years ago, right? Happened to mobile home parks seven or eight years ago, having to sell storage It's having to short-term rentals, it's having to residential real estate. We're just providing the same opportunity, right? With a new asset class and knowing that we have really kind of a short time. We feel like before it is going to be institutionalized. And that advantage kind of goes away and we'll have to go find the next asset or the next thing to go kind of find our niche in the world. What What is what is a, a deal that you would look at and you'd say, absolutely not. That is just a bad RV resort or park to buy. Uh, so for us, I think the biggest one is size. We want to be able to have a full-time um, property manager on site. You know, we don't hire property managers. We hire people that want to run businesses and we you know, teach them how to be a property manager and how to run it. And then we let them have a whole bunch more control than anybody's ever given that person or probably gives most of their employees, right? We find a lot of opportunity by having that super high trust. And so if we can't have a, a site that will ever make enough money to support that person and then still have any kind of profit on top of it, it's probably just not going to be for us. Um, and then the second one is if it's really hard to get to and there's no reason to be there, I don't mm-hmm. care if a lot of people have been there in the past. There may not be there anybody in their future because there's no reason to be there. So uh, for us, a lot of times I'd be like, you know, man camps, places that are, you know, work, you know, way out in the West Texas or up in North Dakota. Not a bad place. People make a lot of money on it. That's just not our business model. And so we try to stay away from places we don't think is a long term kind of defensible vacation investment. If that makes right, sense. Right. Right. Tell me about the long term component. You said earlier that these functions to, an, to a certain extent sort of like a mobile home park. What did you mean by that? Well, so the first one we bought was a 36 space RV park. It had two rows, one road down the middle of it. Um, And functionally, people live there like they were mobile homes. And so uh, one of the things that we kind of recognize is that we're trying to buy destination RV parks where people have short-term stays and they're, they're paying a higher rate for that shorter term. But we also know that based on the lack of affordable housing in this country, that we always have the opportunity if things would turn and people just decide to not vacation anymore, which by the way, hasn't ever been a thing. Uh, but if people stop vacationing, right, we can always take either a portion or the entirety of that park and really turn it back into more, more or less an RV park, mobile home park, um, which would allow long-term renters. We might turn down what we provide for amenities or other services, uh, but there's always kind of a, a baseline. Like if you have it, somebody will pull in. And so for our long-term spots, more than a month at a time, we typically have 10 or 15 people on the wait list for each spot. Um, because there's just not enough places to park these RVs as if they've been printing them so fast and there hasn't necessarily been the same building for the uh, actual RV park spaces. Right, right. Are there are there code considerations or municipal restriction considerations around converting an RV park to a long-term stay RV park? Uh, I can't speak to everywhere. Uh, generally, no. Um, it typically depends on your zoning, but most of our zoning allows us to have longer term. We choose not to because we can get a higher you know, return. Uh, and then generally as a business, uh, we're choosing to not sign leases because just like a hotel, if you don't pay, you got to go, right? We don't want to deal with the evictions. We don't want to deal with the government oversight. Um, and we don't want people to feel like uh, that they're intruding on somebody's living space if they're coming to vacation. So 
if you want to pull out your uh, your plants and you're starting to you know start guarding in front of your tra- your trailer, that's probably not going to be a place that somebody else is going to feel comfortable coming for a night or a weekend. And so we have to make that consideration too. And it takes you know I, I don't mind somebody that stays two or three or four months, even a year. Traveling nurses, traveling contractors, people that are on the road, road working remote, great. Just living there and just leaving all your trash out front, and treating it like mobile home park, that ain't going to work on ours. So just kind right. of a business choice. Right. And again, this this goes back to the vacation theme. Like mm-hmm. it's, uh, that's, that's a really good point that you don't, you want other people to come in and be like, oh, hey, I belong here. Not, oh, I'm intruding on somebody else's, you know, yes. backyard barbecue. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, that is really cool. What about amenities and things like that? I'm sure every park you look at has different amenities. Are there certain amenities you find that bring value? Certain ones you'd say, man, that's, that's, you know, we're, we're, we're getting rid of that on every park we buy. What, what's that front look like for you? I mean, it's really relative based on location and what the park is. Um, for me personally, I, you know, I've got four kids. Like if I'm going to an RV park, I want some water. Like I need those kids to go burn some energy, get messy, you know, not sweat all over me all day. And so if there's not some kind of water feature, it's probably not a place for me. Uh, personally. And so that's probably not going to be a place for us, you know, professionally either. Um, but besides that, there's nothing in the RV park space that I, uh, I feel like I'm really strongly for or against. Generally, if I can find a way to uh, bring that in as part of the business and then not take away, you know, either from time or effort for my, my property manager, it's kind of an add-on, then I'm always willing to try it. Um, and then I'm always willing to throw it out if it doesn't make sense. You know, we've tried to do uh, like paddle boats and some some rentals like that. Great idea. And then we found massive headaches of dealing with, you know, local municipalities on legalities and insurance. And so, hey, okay, great. It's not going to work. We'll just take it away. Like, it's right. not going to hurt my feelings. Um, there's still a lake there. Um, but, you know, it's just things like that, just testing the market and being very willing to kind of continue to learn in a space where there's not a lot of information. And then we'll create that information over time and tell people in two or three years exactly how to do it. Tell me about this classes of RV parks. So there are similar classes like there is in multifamily or is it, I mean, what's the, what's, what's there's definitely, that? yeah, there's definitely kind of the, 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 the highs, highs and the lows, lows. The middle is definitely a lot more squishy. I would describe it. Um, when you start talking about high end kind of RV resorts where, you know, the, the RVs for a lot of these owners uh, of those resorts have to be within 10 years or newer. Uh, and if they're not, you have to get, you know, special permission and they'll deny you or whatever. That's, mm. you know, Tippy top, right? You're talking people that are spending, sometimes even buying condo RV spots, whole different business model than what I'm looking for, right? So we're definitely kind of more that B B class family style park. Um, and then when you start thinking about RV parks that look more like rundown mobile home parks, that's also not what I'm looking for. And so I've not seen a classification system that I love, um, but it's kind of like, you know, when you see it, you'll know. Uh, this is a place. This is a place for me. Or this is not a place for me. And a lot of that comes down to just kind of personal feel. Like, would my family be able to comfortable here? Uh, if not, it's probably not for us. And if so, then let's keep digging and see if this is the right deal. Right. Right. No, that's. I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, and again, the the classification system uh, probably largely doesn't exist because it is so fragmented. It is so mom and pop, and it is so mm-hmm. nuanced to you know the, the to its exact location. I mean, it's some of it. Listen, like I don't want to stay at some places that are perfectly fine to stay, but it just doesn't meet my design or the style or whatever, right? And so, um, if it's a place that you know really you know caters to motorcyclists, that's great. I'm a motorcyclist, I love it, but I probably don't want to stay at a park that's got your super loud bikes going off all night, right? right. Um, so there's so many kind of variability kind of steps there that it's tough to to note. And if you've ever been to RV parks, even KOA, right? The KOAs around the country which is a franchise uh, of uh, RV parking campgrounds, there's a lot of variability in kind of the classification of how nice they are too, right? right. Um, so a lot of it comes down to just your local, who's running day to day and making those decisions to spend the money. Love it. Tell me about your fund. You guys are launching an RV uh, park investment fund. Mm-hmm. Tell us so, about that. So the idea here is that a lot of our investors want to get in the RV parks. We want them in the RV parks with us. Uh, when you start making a, a bet on a, uh, class of like a class at, sorry, an asset class, right? And you start trying to do that on an individual property perspective, you need a lot of data. So it's really easy to make an investment in the uh, apartment space on a deal by deal because you can really understand that data is really, really well, really granular. What we decided was, hey, we think it's probably better for us and for our investors if instead of investors buying into each individual deal in a random place in Alabama or South Georgia, that they, hey, let's take a bigger swing of the the, the bat here and have a have a bigger swath, right? Uh, kind of make a bigger bet on the asset class. So that's what we're doing. We're doing a twenty million dollar um, RV park fund. It allow us to move a little bit faster, buy some of these deals uh, with cash right away, and then refinance out to be able to move even better for some of these mom and pop owners who sometimes have very weird 
requirements for purchase um, and be able to kind of start moving a little bit faster and a little bit faster at a little bit larger scale than we would have had to go deal to deal. Um, and then we think for our investor base that they're going to be really happy by being in the asset class and then have some opportunities uh, to get some broader, you know, not only depth, but also breadth of what they're investing in. Well, the $20 million fund, what would be the total assets under management that that fund could potentially uh, absorb? We're looking probably 60 to $70 million would kind of be our, our expectation. You know, naturally, um, we have kind of delevered as we move into RV park space. Right. There's not the institutional capital that there is in the mobile home park and the, uh, the apartment space. And so we've already kind of naturally delevered just because we can't go and lever up to 80 and 85% on these right. deals like we could in the past. Um, and so we'll keep a little bit lower leverage. One, because there's some unknowns in the economy, but two, that's just kind of the natural kind of place for the space. And we're still making really good returns without having to go kind of unnatural leverage uh, to get there. Right, Nan, and that's that's absolutely you know as as we've observed that space, that's one of the things we found too. It's like we don't we don't have to go high LTV in order to juice returns. Like we can deleverage, take some risk off the table, and still hit exceptional returns. Like that's that's a win win. Yeah, let's not tell anybody. But if you're listening yeah. right now, just turn it off. We didn't talk about this. Yeah, keep, keep that yeah. secret. I have no idea, no idea. Jeremy, this has been a blast, man. Thanks for taking the time to Absolutely. come on today and really talk about the opportunities you guys see in RV parks. It sounds like you got a lot of uh, a lot of passions and a lot of fun. Uh, you know that, that you in- incorporate into your life, and I love the way that you've built a life style around the life that you want. And, you know, like you said, Hey, in two or three years, you may be out of the RV park industry as a whole and ma- made your exit and moved on, but, but you are very opportunistic and I love, I love the enthusiasm and the just go for it mentality you bring to the table. So thanks for sharing with us today. Absolutely. Appreciate it. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you and even maybe your fun, what is the best way to do that? Easiest place to find us, of course, would be the internet. So go to climbcapital.com. Um, you can always email me directly, Jeremy at climbcapital.com. And I can be found on many of the major uh, social media platforms to include some TikToks. So nice. I'll have to look that up. TikTok, Jeremy Hans. There it is, folks. It is. Jeremy, thanks for your time today. I do appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.